playbook, how Israel avoids paying the price when it kills Palestinians, journalists included. Is Elon Musk getting cold feet over his Twitter takeover? And will Twitter hold them to the fire? Competing narratives illustrated. Kiev, the Kremlin, and the battle of the photo ops. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. The killing of Al Jazeera's Shireen Abu Akleh has illustrated the impact of her journalism on Palestinians and cemented her status as an icon there. The images then broadcast around the world. The ugly attacks on those carrying her coffin showed how little dignity there is for Palestinians under military occupation, even in death. As shocking as those scenes were, Israel's subsequent denial and disinformation came as no surprise to Palestinians familiar with the Israeli playbook, the one it uses to deflect, delay, and avoid accountability. Step one is almost always to lie, to build doubt, to blame Palestinians for their own deaths. We saw some of that in the Israeli media's coverage of the Abu Akleh story. It has the effect of muddying the waters, confusing audiences on the outside looking in, and obscuring what to those on the ground is crystal clear, that Israel systematically, deliberately, targets Palestinian journalists for doing their jobs. Our starting point this week is the aftermath of the killing of Shireen Abu Akleh. Al Jazeera says Israeli troops have shot and killed one of their veteran journalists. The passage of time can have an immunizing effect on news audiences when confronted with images like this. Shireen Abu Akleh was shot and killed while covering an Israeli raid. As shocking as they are, like everything else, they get old. Willie, I have covered a lot of funerals here in the Middle East. I have never seen anything like this. Ten days after the killing of Shireen Abu Akleh and the violence at her funeral, the pictures are no less potent. The same goes for the scenes captured three days later at the funeral of another lesser-known Palestinian killed by Israeli forces, 21-year-old Walid al-Sharif. They are images that expose the lengths Israel will go to to suppress and silence Palestinians. And they are nowhere near as exceptional as they look. Why would you attack pallbearers, right, at a funeral? Why wouldn't you allow Palestinians this moment of a sacred ritual? We know that those Israeli officers were given orders to be brutal, signaling that we'll do this and no one will hold us to account, that you have no one to protect you. The end goal of Israeli policy vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians is to destroy them as a political entity. And that's why public events end up being suppressed as violently as they are, because that attests to the existence of a, of a Palestinian nation. Action to the killing of a Palestinian American journalist. When such imagery makes its way around the world, Israel pulls out its damage control playbook, tactics it uses after the killing of a journalist like Shireen Abu Akbar or in the case of Ahmed Erekat, a Palestinian gunned down at a checkpoint in 2020 on the day of his sister's wedding, or Yasser Murtaja, shot and killed in Gaza in 2018 on a day a half dozen other journalists were wounded or injured by Israeli forces. The pattern of the Israeli response in such cases is unmistakable, undeniable. Step number one is lie and build doubt. What Israel does is they claim that they were not responsible. They spread a lie that makes people doubt what happens. Then when undeniable eyewitness evidence or comes up or other challenges to the official narrative. Then we see the equivocation that, well, perhaps the Israeli army was responsible for this killing. Even if it was, it would still effectively 
have been justified in doing what it did. Not only are they putting out disinformation, but they're also failing to allow access that would allow the world to reach its own determination. Selective information is disclosed. Small excerpts, often edited in ways that fit their particular narrative as a way to further their own disinformation. Now, if that also fails, and if there's still international outrage, then step number three is claim to launch an investigation. Israel doesn't really conduct open and fair investigations. Actually, Beit Salem, the leading Israeli human rights organization, said that Israeli investigations are whitewashing their crimes. And then the final step, which is that there is never justice, there is never accountability, and instead Israel reverts to gaslighting anyone who questions. That playbook is completely contingent and predicated on deeply entrenched anti-Palestinian racism. It makes broad audiences receptive to this disinformation and rejecting and skeptical of information that is coming from Palestinians. And it begins by immediately blaming Palestinians for their own death. And in the case of Shireen Abu Akleh, the Israeli military has announced it's not even bothering with a criminal investigation. In recent years, the government's damage control tactics have been repeatedly undone by NGOs and independent investigators armed with technology. When Israeli officials tried to blame Palestinians for Abu Akleh's killing, Bet Selim an Israeli human rights organization quickly used geolocation to disprove that. Forensic Architecture, a research group based in London, led by a British Israeli, did similar work two years ago, partnering with the Palestinian human rights group al Haq to expose the lies Israeli officials were telling about the killing of Ahmed Erekat at that checkpoint. Our model allows us to analyze other perspectives that cast doubt on the military's claims. In the case of uh, my own cousin, who was not only shot six times above the waist in two seconds at a checkpoint where he was denied medical assistance, he was then wrapped up and is still placed in a freezer in punishment for his own murder. And Israel has declared him a terrorist um, and, and has refused to do any investigation. What we saw the Israeli government do there is to take a short excerpt uh, that was cut in a way that it suggested that Ahmed Arakat um, intentionally rammed his car into a checkpoint. Subsequent investigations showed that Israeli forces fired on him not during the moments in which the car hit the checkpoint, but actually when he emerged from the car unarmed with his hands raised up. He did not pose an imminent threat to life, which is the standard uh, for using lethal force under international law. The rise of citizen journalism in Israel-Palestine has changed everything in terms of how the situation is covered. B'Tselem, Forensic Architecture, 972. All of these groups have provided crucial on-the-ground documentation of Israeli human rights abuses that were denied by the authorities. Do I think that that will lead to some kind of major political change? Unfortunately, I find that hard, but that doesn't mean that um, this, this work isn't having a very, very important impact. It is no consolation, not even close, but the killing of a journalist, Shireen Abu Akleh, has become the lens through which, at least temporarily, the larger contextual story is getting the attention it deserves. The daily violence that Palestinians face under occupation and the impunity. Israel prides itself, somehow, on having the world's most moral army, a force that boasts it knows where every bullet lands. And most of the Israeli mainstream media remain loyal to the cause. The Israeli media coverage ranges. On Israeli TV, there's been an emphasis on what does it mean that a journalist was the symbol of the Palestinian cause. Does that not, in some sense, 
discredit her. In right-wing media, you can see straightforward denial of any Israeli responsibility and, and an attribution of Shireen's death to uh, Palestinian militants. The Israeli government, even on the day in which Shireen Abu Akhla was gunned down, was putting out statements essentially suggesting that by having a camera, Palestinian journalists were terrorists. Essentially that any Palestinian reporting on documenting their own lived reality of apartheid and persecution are somehow engaging in terrorism or anti-Semitism, which is ludicrous. The violence against Palestinian journalists is incredibly systematic and the message is that they are risking their lives every time they they go into the field. As put by Mariam Barghouti, a young Palestinian journalist, she stopped wearing the press vest because she realized that it didn't protect her, it actually just made her more of a target. And it's not just Palestinian journalists, but it's also international journalists, which sends the message that Israel can do this with impunity, a deep-seated, entrenched impunity that will allow them to maim and slay and harm without accountability. To Silicon Valley now, and Elon Musk, one of the richest people on the planet, his attempted buyout of Twitter. This deal has taken a few twists and turns since he first tweeted about it a month ago. Nick Muirhead is here with more. The saga of Elon Musk and Twitter has been going on for months now. In April, it looked like he was all set to buy the company for a value of $44 billion. However, last week, Musk tweeted that the deal was temporarily on hold while he examined the number of fake or spam accounts on Twitter. The company estimates that bots form less than 5% of users, but that figure is in dispute. Twitter insists that in order to clinch the deal, Musk had in fact waived his rights to due diligence, and the company says it remains committed to the sale. On Tuesday, its board said that it would enforce the merger agreement, suggesting it will sue Musk if he walks away from the deal. And they're not the only ones trying to keep him at the table. Project Veritas is a far-right activist group in the US, known for working undercover, releasing secretly recorded conversations to discredit opponents. The group has begun releasing secretly filmed videos of Twitter employees making disparaging remarks about Musk. Leads are literally special needs. Admitting that they are leery of a Musk takeover. What do your colleagues say about it? Like, they hate it. And saying that Twitter has a left-wing bias and targets right-wing content. Like because we're actually censoring the right, not the left. Musk has branded himself a free speech absolutist and Project Veritas seems to be enticing him back to the deal in the hope that it would be advantageous for right-wing voices on the site. As for the employees who don't want a billionaire to take over Twitter, one who has just tweeted that he now votes Republican, best to watch what you say and to whom. Thanks, Nick. It's been more than 12 weeks now since Russian tanks first rolled into Ukraine. Beyond the stories from the battlefield, the information war has not gone the Kremlin's way. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, with his theatrical credentials, his digital savvy, has captivated audiences and won friends abroad in a way that Vladimir Putin never could. But is Putin even worried about all the clicks, likes, and support that Zelensky is getting online? Remember, the Russian president has the national media in his corner and he has the military wherewithal. Whether he's losing the global PR battle, or not. The Listening Post's Johanna Hus now on what to make of the photo ops and the PR strategies coming out of Kiev and Moscow. Vlogging from his bunker, beaming into parliaments in combat fatigues, welcoming world leaders on the streets of war-torn Kiev. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has a flair for public relations. Winning the world's hearts and minds, one photo op at a time. He was a comedian. He had never held political office before 2019. He didn't know anything about public policy. But he is indisputably the right man for the job because he knows how to communicate. And he knows how to communicate brilliantly in Russian, which drives Vladimir Putin crazy, right? He can do it in Ukrainian. He can do it haltingly in English. You are here to see this truth 
And if you look at the language that his speechwriters use, they always think about the audience. When he spoke to the US Congress, he mentioned Pearl Harbor. Uh, when he spoke to the Germans, he, he mentioned uh, the Holocaust. When he went to Japan, he mentioned the, the prospect of, of nuclear destruction. His theatrical background is, is very key to, to everything he's done over the course of this war. And so he's well placed to, to use those acting skills, uh, to, to use that kind of emotional connection that actors can forge with an audience to be able to, uh, to, to get what he needs from the West. Are these the most important role of his life? It's sort of, in a way, the most important role in the life of Ukrainians. We've never really had such a direct appeal by a war leader demanding and asking for assistance for his country. We've never really had a leader who has spoken to us, us as the Western audience, us as a media audience. And in that sense, he coming into this role as a war politician, as the face of Ukraine, has been successful. Even if, yes, a lot of it is, of course, scripted, a lot of it is choreographed, but a lot of it is absolutely effective. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi leading a delegation to Kiev. Pedro Sanchez ha podido hablar. News feeds around the world have featured those carefully crafted photo ops. All the Western leaders drawn to Kyiv to show their support and in many cases provide the financial aid Ukraine needs. Names like Johnson, Pelosi, Trudeau have all turned up, not without some personal risk and not without benefits for their own political causes, battles they are fighting at home. The images that we see of, of leaders in Kiev and, and otherwise donning military gear and, and sort of military fatigues, it's as old as war. Politicians try and shore up their images uh, uh, by acting as wartime leaders or at least giving the impression that they're wartime leaders by adopting that image. So of course they want to help Ukraine, but also there is a political element to it too, where they want to uh, be able to use what they can to, to, you know, maybe cover up some of their own domestic difficulties. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson went recently, looked a little incongruous in his suit, I have to say, alongside President Zelensky in his more uh, war-torn attire. But the satirical magazine here in the UK, Private Eye, made quite a bit of this. They put a picture of the two leaders on the front cover with a speech bubble coming out saying thank you for coming to my rescue. The implication of course being that Mr Johnson was trying to revive his own rather difficult political fortunes at that particular time by making this big international trip. So yes of course there's a strong element of public relations here but let's not forget that this is a war that is very much being fought out in the media as well as on the battlefield. Every world leader wants their picture in Kiev right now but I don't think that they're self-serving exercises. I think they're really important right now. Volodymyr Zelensky is by himself and he needs support. Sure, it could help allay domestic critics, but I, I think right now the media narrative is changing and these visits help keep Ukraine in the headlines, which is essential. PR exercise or not, the photo ops are hitting a nerve in Moscow. Perhaps because they send a clear message that Ukraine is still a politically viable nation which is outshining Russia on the global PR stage, in large part because of their telegenic leader. The Russian regime has really tried to portray Zelensky, uh, one, as a puppet of the West, but they have also tried to criticize and downplay his political successes by pointing out that basically he's just an actor. So they have used his previous career to basically suggest that he's not a real politician, he doesn't mean anything, and he's just a good player at it. I think these visits will have caused a degree of irritation in Russia because each one that takes place is a reminder that those objectives set at the beginning of this war, the capture of Kiev within a matter of days, the ending of President Zelensky's administration, it is a reminder that many weeks on, those were not achieved and still have not been achieved. And that so many different Western leaders are going there to say, look, despite the war, this is still a functioning country. A functioning country with a photogenic president who, by comparison, is making Vladimir Putin's PR game fall flat. Lacking the digital savviness or panache, 
Putin has stuck to his old playbook. Media personalities parroting his talking points alongside his own turgid personal performances that would give even the best communications team little to work with. That contrast, Vladimir 2.0 versus Vladimir 1.0, was on full display in last week's Victory Day speeches. Абсолютно неприемлемые для нас угрозы, причем непосредственно у наших границ. Putin used the annual parade to rehash old rhetoric, drawing parallels between today's quote necessity for war and the Soviet Union's fight against Nazi Germany. Цього річ ми кажемо ніколи знову інакше. Zelensky used the same analogy, but to different effect, releasing a slickly produced video in which he compared Russia's invasion of Ukraine to the evils of Nazism. Two speeches, contrasting in both style and substance, but both designed with a very particular audience in mind. President Putin and his suit, you know, he looked very staid. He looked very much a sort of elderly political figure of the last century and somebody who wasn't thinking in terms of the medium in quite the same way. In Zelensky's address, that black and white video shot in the ruined city. Very carefully scripted, very carefully structured to catch the international audience and make it clear that for him, this is, yes, obviously a war that his country is involved in, but it's also a much wider issue for the world. Putin and Zelensky have very different aims and different goals in their public discourse. So whereas for Zelensky, one of his aims is to bring the Ukrainian nation together, and the other one is to appeal to the West. Putin's aims are very different. Putin's aims with his own domestic audience is actually to keep them disinterested. He doesn't need great support or even the rallying around the flag. He just needs the Russian public not to be fervently anti-Putin and not to go out onto the streets. And I think in that sense, the victory speech was successful. Begging the question, who really comes out ahead in this information war? Zelensky with his digital diplomacy and penchant for PR, or Putin with the messengers in the Russian media doing his bidding. The positive reviews, the accolades that Zelensky is getting around the world, are of no consolation, though, to Ukrainians, whose homes and lives have been shattered by Russian bombs falling from the sky. And ultimately, the skies, not the airwaves, not the news feeds, are where this war will be won or lost. And finally, the most dangerous country for journalism in Africa just elected a new president. It wasn't a general election. Somalia's security situation is so delicate that the only people who voted were members of parliament, and they brought back Hassan Sheikh Mohamud, who was president from 2012 to 2017. Mohamud faces all kinds of challenges, a drought that has millions on the brink of famine, the Al-Qaeda-linked militant group Al-Shabaab, which has claimed responsibility for at least 18 attacks this year alone, and there's an ongoing breakdown of societal institutions, including the news media. Over the past 12 years, more than 50 journalists and media workers have been killed there, all of which makes tracking news in Somalia challenging, but there are resources you can turn to. Johar.com is based in the capital, Mogadishu. Its chief editor, Abdi Aziz Golfiade, is a well-connected journalist with a reputation for breaking big stories. Godaway Online is a bilingual news organization based in northeastern Somalia. It's active on Facebook and Twitter, particularly on Twitter Spaces, where it hosts discussions on politics and security. The Heritage Institute is in Mogadishu. It publishes reports on a wide variety of issues and also has a YouTube channel. To solve the, process, the problem of a correspondence relationship lies in Somalia, not in America or in other countries. Among the Somali journalists in the diaspora you can track on Twitter are Farhan Jamali, who spent 18 years with BBC Somali, and Harun Marouf, who is with Voice of America's Somali service. Marouf has also written a book on Al-Shabaab. For more on extremism in the country, Mary Harper from BBC Africa also provides expertise. One diaspora news site we check in on for Somali news is Hiran, 
which operates out of Ottawa, Canada. Its website can get a little crowded, but there are nuggets of writing and analysis there. Those are our recommendations, all quality news sources on Somalia, and they're just a few clicks away on your phone. We'll see you next time here at the Listening Post.